Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks for uh, going to do this. No problem. <clears throat> so you're in Minnesota? Yeah, I'm just outside of uh, Woodbury. Oh, all right. I know where that is. I grew up in West St. Paul. Okay. Yeah, I saw that. That's uh, where I was going to start was just like asking uh, how it was growing up here and um, if there was anything here that made you want to pursue acting. Sure. So I grew up in West St. Paul um, and uh, I went to like Sibley High School in, in uh, West St. Paul. And uh, ever since I was little, I, I was always performing in front of my family and, um, you know, doing little plays and things like that. And, and then when I was in school, I acted in, in school projects and stuff. And uh, I never, you know, there wasn't, I didn't know anybody that was an actor. It didn't seem like that was a clear uh, path for me because it's like, we, you know, we grew up in the suburbs and we <laughs> it was like, didn't know anyone who did this for a living. And, uh, you know, it all seemed like far away and, 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 and not really attainable. And um, <clears throat> Uh, so my initial thing was I wanted to be a forest ranger. So like was I, when I was in jur junior high and uh, high school, uh, I, did, uh, I did a lot of things to kind of going down that path. Uh, I was part of a group called the Junior Naturalists that worked at the Dodge Nature Center in West St. Paul. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and that's kind of, I kind of did that like junior high, high school, um, used to lead field trips through the Nature Center and stuff. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was like an after school program, you know, thing and um, uh, enjoyed that a lot. And I did a lot of canoeing, went up to the Boundary Waters, stuff like that. And then I sort of at, at a point realized, like, in order to be a forest ranger, uh, you need a lot of math. <laughs> <laughs> math and science and those are not my strong points and then I realized that like the U.S. Forest Service only hires like two people a year and you can get a degree in forestry but it doesn't really help you uh you know because there's only so many jobs and then I was like well those odds are pretty rough so I might as well be an actor <laughs> you know which is kind of what I always wanted to do anyway yeah. and so um I just really kind of pushed into that, uh, to following that path. And um, uh, I went to college at Mankato and studied acting. And uh, I did an internship at the Children's Theater Company of Minneapolis. And uh, I worked at the Guthrie. I worked at the Brave New Workshop. I did a lot of comedy. Comedy background is really strong. Um, so I did a lot of improv. And I, that was all through the Dudley Riggs Brave New Workshop, which is in Minneapolis. And... Uh, did things like the Mystery Cafe in Minneapolis, if you're kind of familiar with that. Yep. <laughs> and I did, so I did all sorts of stuff. And I did commercials and, um, uh, and then I just thought I'd come out to LA at a certain point and try my hand at it out here. And that was like 95, 94. And, right. um, and then I started to audition and do things out here. And I get little bit parts here and there. And and then I sort of got into the voice acting thing, which is where I found a little bit of success. But then I also in there did, I went and worked for the Disney Cruise Line and I did improv on their ships. Uh, I did two, two tours um, at the Disney Cruise Line. And um, that was like in 2000, I was part of the inaugural cast of the Disney Magic, the oh. cruise ship there. And we, we were entertainers on board and that was a lot of fun. And um so yeah, so that's, there wasn't like anything that really happened that made me, I just always wanted to do it. You know, I just grew up watching television and I loved it. And I just thought, boy, someday I'd love to just be on a sitcom. And I've been on sitcoms, just little like one-liners and stuff, but nothing, you know, didn't have a whole series around me or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. but, uh, so that's, that's basically the story. I did read too that you and you and Miley were in the same improv group together. Yeah, right? that was at Dudley Rakes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so we used to do improv together. Uh, so that would have been in the 90s. And um, yeah, we had a lot of fun, uh, kind of hung around with this. I'm still friends with a lot of those guys because a lot of them have now moved out to um, to California. And it's people like Mo Collins, who was on yeah. Mad TV, and she uh She's now on The Walking Dead and uh, Melissa Peterman, who was on Reba. Um, so sh she was part of that group. Oh, Cedric uh, Yarborough, who was, um, uh, or Cedric, I said, said, said Cedric, 
who was on um, Speechless. Yeah. Uh, he was also on Reno 911. So he went to Mankato too. So did Melissa Peterman. They both, all three of us went to Mankato State. So not at the same time, but we mm-hmm. were we were all there. So yeah, yeah. it's kind of, you know, it's it's a small world. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you get into SAG when you moved to LA? Uh, actually, I got, well, it's funny because I moved out to LA and I started auditioning, but then I had an opportunity to audition for a movie in Minnesota, believe it or not, after I'd already moved. It was, it was within months. Like I moved in February and then in March, I got this call to like a local hire to do um, local for Minneapolis because they were shooting the, the movie in Minneapolis. That was called Beautiful Girls, that movie. Yeah. And so I joined SAG to be part of that um, thing. The, the movie actually cost me money to do because oh. <laughs> I, I had to fly back to to do the movie and um but you know it was worth it because I got into in the SAG and that was kind of a big deal that at the time um uh, Lauren Holly was in the movie um Matt Dillon uh, Rosie O'Donnell right. um Michael Rappaport um just it's uh Tim Hutton I mean Natalie Portman that was her first movie yeah. um of course, I never, I, the only person I worked with was really Lauren Holly. Uh, we had one little scene kind of midway through the picture and um, uh, it was a really interesting experience and it was fun and, and that's how I got my SAG card. Mm-hmm. I know some other credits after that, you got to be on Beverly Hills 90210. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was a fan and they turned the Peach Pit into a uh, sports bar and it was the Super Bowl. And so I was a fan who was, the, everything was falling apart. They couldn't get the cash register to open. And then it was just a nightmare. And I was a demanding customer at the bar, you know. Okay. So <laughs> that was a uh, real funny thing about that is so it's a bar scene. It's supposed to be loud and people are cheering and there's touchdowns. And then they're behind the counter and Brian Austin Green's trying to get the thing, the cash register open. And uh, Tiffany Amber Thiessen's trying to help him. And, mm-hmm. you know, even though she said she wasn't going to help him, it was that kind of a thing. Like they were trying to. Yeah, it's a lot tougher than it looks was kind of the lesson of the thing. And it's supposed to be this huge, big scene, big people. And I'm at the end of the bar and I'm like, hey, can I get a beer down here? You know, that was that kind of thing. Well, when we shoot it, so background, they, they roll and it's loud and there's music playing and there's noise. And then when they do the dialogue, they cut all that off and it's completely yeah. silent in the thing. And then uh, what I think is really funny is that Brian Austin Green and Tiffany Amber Thiessen are having this conversation and they're talking, they're like, I don't know if I can get the cash register to open because it's like, and they almost are like whispering through the whole thing. But we're in this supposedly loud, loud place. I'm at the end of the bar, nobody's saying a word. I can barely hear them to give my cue, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) But if you were in a setting like that, you'd be screaming. You're like, I don't know. I don't know why the the cash register is not opening because there's so, there'd be so much noise. But they did the opposite. They talked very quiet and very low. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I don't know how it played on, on screen, but it, 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 if you if you look at it sometimes, you think like, no, they'd be screaming in that situation because it's so loud yeah. in, the, in the environment. But uh, they, they played it completely opposite, which I thought was kind of funny. So anyway, and they were all very nice to me there. Uh, my dressing room was right across this, uh, the way from um, Tori Spelling. She oh, was right across, yeah. uh, across the way. And she was watching reruns of, of Beverly Hills 90210, which was on in the afternoon while we were filming. Yeah. And then she was talking to like Ian Zelling, like, hey, look at this. Look at your hair, man. Like how that was, <laughs> it was such yeah. a weird experience. They came in and they said, hey, we're going to have pizza for lunch. Would you like some pizza? And I was like, sure. And I'm like, and they go, what would you like? And I go, anything and whatever everybody's having, that's fine. You know, sausage, fine. Yeah, that's fine. They bring me a whole large pizza. Like I here, I thought we were eating it like together, where, you know, and I was just being easy. Like I'll take whatever you got. They brought me in a not and not a small personal size pizza, like a large pizza. And yeah. I, was, I thought that's the weirdest. I t- ended up taking it home because it was like, but it was so funny. Like I'm sitting in my dressing room with a large pizza, just eating by myself. <laughs> it was strange. Yeah. <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. They were all. They were all. They had been doing the show for like ten years at that time, so they they knew what they were doing and they made it real easy, and um, and yeah, it was a good time. It was a good cast and. Um, they were very warm to me who came in and I just had a couple of lines and they were very gracious. So, um, Mm -hmm. it it was all very nice. So, and was there anything that 
happened that made you want to pursue voiceover opposed to on camera? No, it's just one of those things as an actor, I think we, you know, it's funny because I think a lot of people that watch uh, anime and watch, uh, you know, that kind of entertainment voiceover stuff, um, they think like, that's all we do. Right. And, <laughs> and you know, I was, uh, I was doing commercials. I was doing walk-ons on sitcoms. I was doing one-liners and dramas. I was doing, uh, I did improv. I worked in nightclubs. I did, I, you know, I dressed up as Cupid at a convention once and handed out candy to get people to come to a booth. I mean, we as actors just do everything. It's just, sometimes there's one thing you do that you get noticed for. And that was sort of what the voice acting thing was. And I always thought, uh, you know, I loved cartoons growing up and, um, and I always thought, well, I got a good voice for cartoons. I got a high voice. It's a little unique. And um, I thought, yeah, I'd love to do animation. I'd love to do, uh, you know, cartoons and who wouldn't, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's really fun. It's a really fun thing to do. And, um, and as it turned out, I was, uh, how I got into it was, I was out here, I was doing auditions and stuff. I had an agent, um, but I went to a party at Melissa Peterman's house, actually, oh. uh, who's on Reba. And, and she, her husband, John, and I are really good friends. We did comedy together in Minneapolis as well. And uh, he has got a friend named Jeff Nimoy. And Jeff Nimoy was the director of Digimon. Oh. And so I went in, you know, I'd see Jeff at these parties and I'd be like, hey, Jeff, you know, uh, I think I got a unique voice. I'd love to be doing, you know, imp uh, improv and, and, and doing um, voiceovers on, you know, on your show. Is there any opportunity I could audition for Digimon or something? And he said, he was basically like, yeah, you and everybody else. Every actor in town thinks that they can do voiceover, but it's not that easy. And especially, and this is kind of interesting, um, anime is not, it's, it's a little harder to do than regular uh, voiceover. So anyway, I went to Jeff Nimoy. I said, could I audition? He goes, have you ever done ADR work, which is voice replacement, uh, which is anime dubbing? And, uh, and I said, well, no, but I'd love the opportunity to learn. And he's like, I can't use you. You know, <laughs> if you don't have any experience, I'm not going to take time to teach you. So I, sorry, I can't use you. No, I, I'm not, I'm not going to ha have you audition or anything like that. So I was like, every time I saw him, then I just thought, I'm just going to ask him, I'm going to bug him. And that's exactly what happened. And then I found out they were doing Digimon, the movie, and he had called in John and Melissa, my friends, and they hadn't done any. ADR work before in the past. So I called Jeff Nimoy up and I go, hey, what, what the heck? You know, you, you, you brought in John and Melissa to audition. Can I at least audition? And he's like, fine, I'll let you audition. <laughs> so I auditioned for D Digimon movie. The producers liked me and they asked me, you know, a whole bunch of questions in the booth. And then they said, well, have you ever done ADR before? And I was like, honestly, no, I have not. Um, this is, you know, glad for the audition and willing to learn. And they said, well, we can't really use you for the movie. Can't really use you for the, the movie uh, because we got to get this thing done, but maybe we can put you in a couple episodes and there might be some other projects. And that was at Saban Entertainment. Yeah. So I did a couple episodes. Jeff Nimoy had to direct me. <laughs> so, <laughs> we had to, uh, so I played Michael in Digimon and, uh, and I did like three, three episodes, maybe something like that. And he directed me and we, we got through it because it was basically a training session. And then they offered me a show called Shinzo. Right. And I worked with a director by the name of Michael Sorich, who was really the guy who taught me how to do it. Like he was, he was, cause we did 35 episodes. I was the lead of the show. Um, they basically hired me and they said, we're going to hire you for three episodes and if you don't work out, if you don't get up to speed, then we're just going to have to let you go and we'll cast somebody else. And I was like, okay. And there was a lot of pressure. And then like the third episode came and I was like, well, did I get the job? Am I going to stay? Am I, do I get to keep this? <laughs> what am I, what's going on? And uh, then the fourth, fifth episode, sixth, I go, well, I guess I got the job. And I just ended up recording the whole thing. Yeah. And um, Michael Sorich, uh, again, guided me through that whole process. And he, he was really fun guy to work with. And, um, and so after that, then I was able to do a variety of different things and I could go in and say, yeah, I have ADR experience. So, mm -hmm. and that helped a lot. I got an audition for Naruto, which was 
couple years later and uh, and they were calling in everybody in town and I went in and they had they said pick three sides three characters that you might be interested in I picked Naruto uh, Choji and Shikamaru and I and I don't know why I kind of did Shikamaru as like sort of a surfer dude at that point uh, this was like the early days you know like oh whatever what a drag you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, and that, that ended up clicking with them. And so they cast me as Shikamaru. And even that was, cause he's not in it in the first few episodes. Like he's very, uh, uh, it's mostly about Naruto, the first few, like five or six episodes. And so I was like, did they change their minds? Cause they cast me and then I didn't hear from, I did like, I did one session where I did two lines and then it was like three or four months. And then they called me again and I was oh. like, uh, maybe they didn't like me. Maybe they recast it. I don't know. But it turned out my just Shikamaru wasn't in it in those first yeah. like 20 episodes or whatever. He was only in like episode three and then you don't see him again until episode 24 or something. So um, so that was kind of funny. And then, then it was off to the races because then I think I was in, of the 750 episodes we did, I think it's something like 400 episodes that Shikamaru was in, something yeah. like that. So. Sometimes you just have one line, but that still counts that you're in that episode, you know? Mm -hmm. So. And regarding Shikamaru, the main thing I was going to ask was, um, what's the darkest emotional headspace you had to get into for voicing him? Well, it's kind of interesting because you don't, I never read ahead. I don't read, I didn't read the manga. So, um, and I had heard that there was some big story arc with Shikamaru coming down the line, mm -hmm. um, just sort of by, by rumors. Uh, when you show up to the studio, you have no idea. You, you, there's no way to prep. You know? right. So that's the other thing about voice acting. And, and in some ways, it's super easy because you can show up. You, you don't have to have shaved. You can roll out of bed. You can just get there and <laughs> you know, you're alone in the booth. On the other hand, they don't send you the script ahead of time. You have no chance to read and kind of prepare. You just are doing what we would call a cold read. Like if you're auditioning, you, they just hand you something, you get it, you get like two minutes, you look at it and then you just do it. And uh, so in a way uh, I experience things in real time. So as an actor, I'm, things are happening and I'm reacting to them. Now the director guides you through it because they know the story, they know where it's going. So they're going to say, okay, this, this is important. You're starting to get upset. And then, you, you know, so you ratchet up the intensity, intensity. So like, um, you know, spoiler alert, like when um, Asuma uh gets into trouble i'll just say it like that <laughs> it's been 10 years but st people still get upset you know so <laughs> oh i didn't get to that part yet and um i had no idea that was what was happening while it was happening and so even still i was like is he gonna be okay is this is he is he gonna die is it what, what's gonna happen you know and I'm experiencing it in real time and that's what shikamaru is actually doing too right because yeah. he doesn't know if it's gonna, how bad this situation is gonna get, right? So he's he's sort of in the same mode, like is how bad is this gonna be, and what are we gonna do? And don't worry, you know, be quiet. We'll get help. You know, we're gonna. And he and Awesome, meanwhile, saying, you know, no, I need to tell you something. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is happening. So, um, so a lot of that emotion is real because I'm experiencing it in real time. And it does get dark. I remember um, it might've been that, or like when there's a scene shortly after that, where I'm with my father and he says, uh, you know, let it all out, Shikamaro, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I just remember there was one of those two scenes after we got done with the session, <laughs> Mary Elizabeth, who was directing, um, she came out of the director's booth and she gave me a big hug. And she's like, you know, I know it's tough. It's tough. Cause you allow yourself to go there in the moment. And then in, I think, I think in a way, if you think about it too much, then you, you kind of might be embarrassed. Like it sounds silly or you're crying or you're making these noises and sounds and getting really upset. And, and, uh, and then you, you, if you thought about it too much, you might go, you might be more self-conscious about it. But since I didn't have a chance to think about it, you just throw yourself into it and you just let it all out. Right. And um, I think it worked. Uh, I get a lot of people commenting on how 
that was such an intense scene and how um, that they were moved by that. And, and yeah. uh, so I, you know, I'm like, well, good, thank goodness that my instinct was right. And I, I went down the right path. Um, but that's having a good script and a good director and um, a good engineer who can kind of put it all together and make it sound the way it needs to sound. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it is strange because you don't get a chance to prepare at all. You just are reading it and experiencing it. And so all the same thoughts that Shikamaru is having, I, Tom Gibson having in the booth, like, what's going on? Why is this happening? You know, <laughs> where, where are we going with this? You know, and uh, all those frustrations. So um, I've had, I've had the fortune and that's the great thing about this show is a lot of the side characters um, have story arcs that are really intense and really deep and give you a real insight to these characters and how they fit into the greater picture. And Shikamaru's just had some great story arcs with the whole going after Hedon right. and being able to defeat him, even though he's a far more powerful uh, being than Shikamaru is, but Shikamaru outwits him and pulls him into a trap and then is able to neutralize him. I'll say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so there, there's been some really intense moments on that show. And um, I, I just think it's, I think it's just a well-written show. It's just such a great, all those characters you can relate to, you know. Um, I think if you look at all the characters that are presented, if, you know, if you're a kid living in this day and age, there's, we know the guy who's kind of a slacker, who's a little too cool for school, who's a little too smart for his own good. We know the kid that just likes to eat and he's kind of a gregarious, happy fella. You know, we know the kid that's way into like school and training and wants to be the best. And, you know, all these little characters, we kind of know the guy that's into his dog, <laughs> you know, and yeah. likes to go hunting and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so we, we, we know these characters, right? The, uh, the girls that are jealous and they're fighting over Sasuke. And, you know, it's, it, you can find any of these characters in any sort of typical American high school. And I think, I think that's the appeal of the show is because yep. everybody kind of relates to Naruto. And then from there, they're all the little side characters. Like you either know somebody that's like that or you are that person. You know what I mean? And I think that's why the show has such great appeal, you know? Right. So, and it treats, you know, younger people with respect and it treats that there are emotional things going on, you know, uh, it treats that treats them as real people, not mm -hmm. just sort of archetypes or, um, you know, cartoons. Mm -hmm. And I think my personal favorite role of yours was uh, in Marmalade Boy. Oh, really? Because that was like doing 90210. Yeah. Except, no, here's the funny thing. See, I'd never get cast at that, right? But my mm -hmm. voice would be, and they, you know, the way he looks and behaves on screen and that, uh, that that's a very dramatic piece. And I thought that was really well written too. And um, actually both Honey and Clover and Marmalade Boy, I think were really well, uh, well written. And um Actually, Prince of Tennis, same kind of thing. I played yeah. kind of a rich jerk in that one too. <laughs> and it, like these shows could be like 90210 or Dawson's Creek or yeah. something. It, the funny thing is though, this face would never have been cast in those roles. <laughs> so that's the fun of doing voiceover. You can really be people that you wouldn't necessarily get cast in. So, mm -hmm. but you do have, you know, the actors do have the emotional capacity to do it. And it's just our voices are, you know, in one way, by being a voice actor, you're a little bit handicapped because you can't use your face, you can't use your body, you can't use your actions. You, it's all done through your voice. On the other hand, it makes it really easy to just go and focus on just that thing. The thing, the words and how you're trying to convey them and the emotions that you're trying to get across you're, you're not distracted by the costume itches or, you know, this, these props are weird or what am I doing with my hands? You know, <laughs> you know, got to hit your mark. You know, all that stuff gets peeled away and you can just focus on the work, which, or the, the emotion of the scene. And um, so that, that is the kind of benefit of doing voiceover. So even though they take away your face and everything else that, that, <laughs> that helps all the other tools that the actors use, you know, 
So is there any kind of um, story specific to Marmalade Boy with getting the role or like your relationship? That was that was a long time ago, but I do remember I'm trying to think Um, we had a great director for that one. It was very it was shot here in Burbank, very close to where I'm at right now. Uh, It was funny because we never really met anybody in the entire cast of Marmalade Boy. And uh, so at the end, when the show wrapped, we had a rap party and that was kind of fun because it was, it was like, it was at Michelle Ruff's house and like Yuri Lowenthal was there, Tara Platt was there, all these people that, that also then went on to go be in Naruto, a lot of them. And, uh, so that was kind of neat. Cause that was like my first sort of meeting all these people that are, cause if you look at like a lot of our uh, credits. There's a lot of cross pollination on different shows. Right. You see, you see certain combos of people that kind of travel together, and um, you know some of us are in more things than others. I'm not in as many things as like Yuri. Yuri just works like crazy, uh, and he's good. So you know, it's uh, I can get it. You know, uh, that was kind of fun to have uh, have that opportunity to kind of get together with the cast because most of the time you never meet these people. <laughs> you know, you act with them and you do all these scenes and. You never see them. You know, you might see them when they're coming in and you're leaving. But uh, for the most part, you're working in the booth by yourself and you're just with the director. And everybody has a, a relationship with the director, but then they don't as a cast, you know. So uh, it's kind of one of the odd things of this kind of acting. So Yeah. And with Honey and Clover, uh, how could you relate to Talk of Me the most? So, but as I recall, I think Honey and Clover was the one and I again i really liked it because that was more like we were 20 somethings and we worked for a publishing company as i remember and i liked that you know i just had like a a normal role in a normal drama yeah and and again i don't know if i would have been cast in that in real life so it was such a great opportunity to play something that i wouldn't necessarily play my voice could do it but you know this face this you know wouldn't have necessarily fit in that so i I, I just think that was a, kind of an, I look back at that, um, those, those kind of roles. And I just, I just like, wow, that, that was a lot of fun to do because it's so different, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and really, I don't know too many people who watched those shows. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it wasn't like it was a big hit. There was a, you know, went to DVD and I, you know, I might've played on television somewhere, but there's a, like a cult following with it, but it, uh, I just thought it was really great that we were telling stories, you know, ninjas and explosions and superheroes, that stuff all makes sense to be like in cartoons, but then just a straight up, you know, drama about young people living their lives. It's kind of cool that anime has a place for that as well, you know, and it's, uh, it's very much like we would never do that here in the United States. We would, those would be like Dawson's Creek or, you know, those kind of shows. And we'd never, you'd never animate it. But in Japan, that's just as legit to go, we're going to animate this rather than act it out. You know, <laughs> it saves yep. us a ton of money on sets and everything else. We just have to hire animators. So, mm-hmm. and it's still, I feel it still has the same punch, you know, the, the, the drama and the, um, the writing is, you know, great storytelling. It's just a different way to tell stories. And I think in Japan, anime is a art form that is more accepted you can tell any kind of story this way and it's not looked down on like, that's a cartoon or I yeah. hate animation. It's just like, oh, that's just a different way to tell a story. And it, they, they're, they're, there's not as many barriers. Like I think here we throw all our sort of fluff, our, you know, it's like kid stuff here, yeah. really. But there it's not so much kid stuff. It's, it's, it's a little bit more wide audience, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and it's looked at as an art form mm-hmm. as opposed to, like here, we kind of look at it as it's a cartoon. You know, yep. It's for kids. It's it's light. It's fluffy. It's nothing. Meanwhile, there's all this stuff going on in these shows that are very emotional and you know deep. And uh, you know, people people watch our show and get get upset. And I've heard people say, "Oh, I broke down and cried when this character died or that thing happened." And I go, "I get it. It's mm-hmm. it's intense." You know, and I think a lot of a lot of mainstream culture kind of poo-poos it, right? They just kind of like, oh yeah, it's just anime. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, you have no idea. The reason people love this is because it's good. You know, it's 
really fun stuff and it's really really intricate storytelling and uh, so maybe someday because it's all this stuff is on tape it shows up on netflix it'll you know it'll get um somebody will pick it up and you know run it and experience that who never would have thought they would like it and then realize oh it's great it's it's awesome and you know we we should get more of that <laughs> Because the people that are into it are really into it and they, they understand what it is and what they have. And uh, the people that aren't into it, well, it's their loss, you know, so. I can imagine that uh, your popularity on TikTok must have caught you off guard. It did. It, <laughs> you know, I wasn't really doing the social media stuff um, that much. I, I had a I mean, I had a Facebook account and I remember doing an interview and this was maybe a year and a half ago. And somebody said, do you have anything to plug? And I was like, no. And they're like, where can we find you on social media? And I go, well, I have a, I have a TikTok or not. I have a um, Instagram. No, sorry. I have a Twitter account, but I never use it. Yeah. And uh, so I was even like, I don't know why I'd even give it out because I don't really do anything with it. And then uh, Miley Flanagan, who plays Naruto, she, uh, she called me up. This is, we were in the middle of lockdown, <laughs> you know, and she goes, Hey, we're going to do this online convention and we're going to do a Naruto thing. And I want you to do it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and she said, we're going to do uh, an autograph signing. So you got to get some like eight by tens or something. And I didn't have anything. I didn't, oh. I didn't have anything to sell or anything to do. So I was like, okay. And I got some artwork and I had it put together and we printed up some prints and then we did an event and I sold like 25 pictures, something like that, you know, and I couldn't believe that anybody want to buy them, but I was like, Oh, okay. And so I had to create an Instagram account just for that. And we would do live signings using Instagram live. Right. So that, yep. that was the whole reason I had to download it. I wasn't really interested in doing anything with it, but, um, and so then I realized that my DMS people would, to, you know, contact me in the DM and they're like, Hey, Shikamaro, can you, it's my birthday. Can you say happy birthday in the voice? And I would just hit the little record button and go, happy birthday, Mike. Hope it's not a drag, yeah. you know? <laughs> and uh, I would do stuff like that. And, and a couple of those things ended up on TikTok. And next thing I know, my DMs just blew up. Like I had, you know, has 99 plus on there. And it just was like, okay, now I don't even know. I was, I was responding to people in that. And it's funny. Cause like Miley would give me advice. She goes, Oh, don't respond to DMS. Cause once you start doing that, it's just going to be a mess. <laughs> so it's like, okay, well now I'm got all these people asking for stuff. And then I'd get people that would be like, if I didn't get to it in time, they're like, Oh, thanks. You know, thanks for, you know, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't get to everybody. And, uh, but anyway, so then my wife had suggested, she goes, you should go on Cameo. And I go, no one's going to pay to have me do a message. It's kind of, I don't know. So I did it. First, you had to qualify and they accepted me. And I was like, well, that's okay. All right. And then I started doing them and um, it was going pretty good. And then this, uh, I did a Cameo and somebody put it on TikTok. And it went viral. Like it was huge. Like it had yeah. 2 million views or something. And then all of a sudden my cameo started to blow up. So I was like, I better get on TikTok just so I know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I started interacting with people and doing questions and answers and stuff. And, uh, and it blew up. And I like, next thing I knew I had 60,000 followers, then I had a hundred thousand followers. So I called up Miley and I said, Hey, Miley, are you on TikTok? Cause you got to get on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> and so Miley got on TikTok and then we did a couple duets and, um, and it went big. And then she got to about, we both got to around 300,000 at the same time. And, and right now I think she's at like 355, but for some reason I kept going, I'm at three or 545 right now, Yeah, uh, 545,000 followers. And it's crazy. I don't, you know, and I just do lines of dialogue from the show. Uh, you know, people I've done like you know, voice mess, me, voicemail messages for your machine, <laughs> you know, just doing little weird things that Shikamaru might say. And then re recently people have been sending me movie lines to do. So I did this whole thing from Dirty Harry. Mm -hmm. Like they just said, what would Shikamaru sound like if he was cast as Dirty Harry? And it was like, did I shoot five or six? Do you feel lucky, punk? You know? <laughs> and I've been having a lot of fun with that. And people sort of enjoy that kind of stuff. 
And, uh, and it's real easy because it's like 15 seconds, 30 seconds, or most three minutes, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's just been growing and going crazy. And my cameos have been blowing up and I've been doing real well with that. And, and even though it's 15 years that the show's been on, uh, th- there's just, there's new people getting into it on a daily basis because it's so accessible now with uh, Netflix and all of that. So it's been great. So I've just been kind of appreciative of the fact that, you know, there's anybody interested out there mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I've just been trying to have fun with it. And then, so, uh, I mean, cameo has been great because, you know, you, you pay and then you, I do a birthday message and, and I try and um, personalize it and make it unique. And I kind of have a little pattern of like, okay, if it's a birthday, this is kind of what I know what I'm going to kind of say. And then I interject the specifics that they give me into it. And the nice thing about Shikamaru, he can complain about everything. So it's, you know, you I can just go on and say like, oh man, I have to do another birthday message. I want to drag. I don't want to do this. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> and that works, right? Yeah. You know, like if you're Rock Lee, you have to bring it every time. You have to be like, I'm full of training and it's your birthday. So be happy. <laughs> Whereas Shikamaru could just say, Oh, brother, another one, you know, <laughs> so, um, so I can get away with murder just by being, and, and there's a, uh, I try and be funny with it too. And, um, you know, really reference the show and uh, have a good time. And so I feel like I put on a little show and I give people their, their money's worth. Cause I also feel like it's so weird that people are paying me, paying money to see me do this thing. And then, so I really try and make it worth their while, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So do you still get a decent amount of people that reach out about uh, Sukari to Kabaneri? You know, I I, th- I thought that show was going to be a super hit. And it's on Netflix, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and if anybody who's watching this, if you have not checked it out, you should check it out. That is a great show. Yep. But for some reason, and I think it's kind of the way, because it went to Crunchyroll first, and then it was like a you had to pay to see it initially. And so I don't think it got the traction that like other shows have gotten. And I don't know, it never, I don't get asked about it that much, but that show is awesome. That is a crazy, it's a train. The premise of the show is we're in the zombie apocalypse. Basically the world is kind of ended and we have this train that's running on this track and we're hitting all these little towns trying to pull out as many survivors as we possibly can. And uh, I play an engineer that keeps the train running and I'm bitter and sort of angry. And everybody, <laughs> everybody kind of thinks he's, he might, might be a spy or he might be working against them. It's just, he's very self-centered and very, he's, he's going to save himself over mm-hmm. anybody else. So if, if it comes down between, there's no her, heroics from this character. <laughs> <laughs> he's like uh you know the train leaves at three o'clock and if you're not on the train i'm leaving this train is going to leave and i will leave you at three o'clock so he and he will like he's not there's no messing around he's not gonna risk himself for anybody else in the end you know he, there's a little more to him than than that but that's at least the persona he puts up and um and so it's it that is a great show and it's you know, got zombies and it's horror and, uh, you know, people are turning and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's got all the, it's got all the elements. It should have been a super mega hit. And, um, I think it did really well in Japan, but for some reason here, it's not, it hasn't caught on quite the same, but it is on the movies are on Netflix. So Mm -hmm. you can check them out. And I think the series was only like 12 episodes long. And I don't know if, they cut them up and put them, made them into longer forms for Netflix. Cause it seems like there's, seems like we did 12 episodes and two movies, but for some reason on Netflix, there's like four movies. So yeah. maybe they did take the series and kind of package it somehow. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't really checked it out on Netflix, but yeah, that was a fun one to do. And um, I wish, I wish we were doing, well, we might be doing more. I don't know. Uh, but you, you never say never. Cause you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you get a phone call and you go hey we're doing this again it's like great you know uh 
the beauty of like Naruto, Naruto Shippuden and Boruto for me is that they, one just rolled into the other. So it never really ended. And people, people go, how, how do you feel about, you know, Naruto ending? And I was like, it, it really didn't, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's the most, the most we've had off was maybe like three or four months mm -hmm. um, where we were catching up or something and, um, or we were waiting for scripts and, um, but really for me, it's just been for the last 15 years, just been once or twice a month, I get a call, come in, do a couple hour session and we just keep recording. So it hasn't been for everybody, but it's been for, for like me and Miley and a few others. We've, uh, cause I'm in, I'm in a lot of episodes in Boruto. Boruto. Now it's far more boring. <laughs> Shikamaru doesn't do much. He's sort of an administrator in the show and he works as a kind of a right hand to the Hokage. We don't get out there and fight as well. Naruto does, but I don't. Mm -hmm. I, so far I haven't. <laughs> Not too many Shikamaru battle scenes in this one, you know, so. And have you been approached to be in more recent anime or like audition no, for anything? Uh, or basically uh, it's kind of a funny thing is i i've never had an agent for voiceover which is weird. oh okay and uh i've had an agent for on camera and other things um just recently i've decided to kind of try and start, pursue to get do an agent for voiceover work because i think there's more things basically how it's worked for me is I got on one show, which led to another show, which led to another show. And it was just basically the people I worked with. And there's a small group of people that I have worked with that do call me up from time to time and say, hey, can you come in and do a small character in this or that? And, and it's been great. But there's other avenues that I don't have a personal connection to. So that's where an agent I think could help yep. is get me in. Cause I'd like to be doing more video games, to tell you the truth, more like uh, far cry and, mm -hmm. you know, fallout and, and call of duty and stuff like that. Um, uh, I think there's, I think there's opportunity there that I could be doing, you know, more, more stuff, which also is stuff I would love to do because I play those games and I, you know, enjoy that format. And so, and there's a lot more, uh, animations and stuff uh animes and original there's a lot of original stuff especially with like netflix and everything there's you know they did the uh, he-man reboot and they did they're using a lot of stars for that but you know a lot of those little characters could be people like me so i think that's where uh if i had an agent out there kind of getting me those opportunities at least to audition um that would help because right now it's just word of mouth <laughs> you know right. and it works i mean i've been working i've been i've been doing enough stuff but it's like I'd love to be doing more, you know what I mean? Uh, I, I, but that's true about everybody. Tom Hanks says, I wish I was going out more. I wish I was getting more stuff. <laughs> every, every actor feels like, ah, oh, why didn't I get auditioned for that? You know, what's what's going on? So, um, so yeah, so that's, and actually with the sort of growth of TikTok uh, and Instagram and, and my profiles on there, uh, that, that kind of means a little bit more to the agents and stuff. Cause yeah. like if I promote, there's a certain amount of people that they know that they can reach uh, for, for shows and stuff. So it shouldn't play in, but it does play in. And so I'm kind of playing that game right now and trying to make it work for me and see if I can turn it into anything. But right now it's all new territory and I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see where it goes. And is there any kind of uh, like up upcoming projects that you're a part of that you can talk about or? You know, that's the funny thing is uh, when things come up, they come up fast. And so you're either doing something or you're not. They're, the only thing I really have active on the books right now is Boruto. Okay. But I could have tomorrow, I could be, uh, you know, somebody could say, hey, can you audition for this? And I'd be like, great. And mm -hmm. that can all change in a, in a minute. So um, have I, so let's see, what was the last new thing? I did, well, I did, I did something for Kabanari and the Iron Fortress that was during the pandemic. So that wasn't that long ago. Okay. Um, but I think that's already aired on Netflix. I think that's caught up. So I, don't, I think that everything I recorded for that is now aired. Um, cause they were quick on that. That was a quick turnaround. And, uh, and for a while there, there wasn't anything going on other than Boruto because, we were in lockdown and the great thing about voiceover too 
is during lockdown, I was able to go in and record. Now, Miley records from home. I have a home studio, but I've never used it to do anything. I do it mostly for auditions. I've been going in to the studio. That's what I was going to say. Uh, I've been vaccinated. The beauty of it is you pull up to the studio, uh, you text them, you say you're there, they open the door, you wear a mask, you walk in. I bring in my own headset. I bring in my own iPad. Um, I go into the booth, they close the door, I take off the mask, they set, I set the mic to my, you know, to the thing. And then I pull out my iPad and they send me the scripts and I do the scripts right there. And yeah. I'm in the booth by myself, the director's behind glass, <laughs> you know, then when I'm done, I walk out and I go straight to the parking lot and it's boom. It's like the safest, cleanest, easiest thing. And then they, they give it like a couple hours before they bring in the next actor. And there's, I don't know how, you know, like the, we've been doing it basically this way. We've added just a few tweaks to that process for, for the COVID lockdowns, but really that's how we record. You don't really run into other people. You, you kind of record in isolation and um, it's super safe, clean, easy way to do it. So uh, we've been able to keep working through this whole time period, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, I get a lot of, people fans online saying you know when is boruto coming back <laughs> and i'm like we never stopped now yeah. they get a little behind on the dub you know the subs come out and then the dubs come out later but we've been recording the whole time so um i don't know why they're not caught up that's more of a technical thing like when they edit them and put the shows together package them and then where they air i don't you know i don't that's all that's all on the studio side. So I don't get into any of that. All I can say is that I've been recording the entire time. So, okay. um, which has been nice because there's a lot of actors that haven't been able to work at all. Of course, now everything's lightened up now. Everything's kind of, people are back to work and doing stuff. But there was a time there when nobody was doing nothing. And I was just like, the only thing I got really rolling is Boruto, which is, it's great. Cause you know, it was something uh, I'm work. at least I'm working, I'm doing something, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. So while well, I sit in my house and, you know, not talk to people and <laughs> was waiting for things to happen. Like, yeah. <laughs> when's it going to end? You know, so, but slow but sure, we're getting back to normal. So that's nice. So maybe there's going to be some more audition things I can do coming up, but. Okay. Yeah. And uh, my final question for each interview sure. is uh, what do you want your legacy to be? Um, you know, it's funny. It's interesting. Most of the time you don't really know when you're, when you do a play, when you do a live performance, there's an immediate response from the audience. They laugh, they applaud, they, you know, they say great show, you know, whatever. And you're just like, wow, that's great. I, you know, I've entertained these people. I've, uh, there's been an immediate response. It's very fulfilling. And then when you do anything that's filmed or anything that's taped, recorded, you have no idea. You kind of put it out there and you have no idea what happens. I'll tell you the beauty of doing these cameos. And I was, <laughs> I was joking. I was joking with a friend. I go, if anything ever happens to me and if I pass away or something, <laughs> not to be morbid, I said, I just want people to read my reviews on cameo. <laughs> Because like, it is so great to have people that go, you know, I was having a bad day or, uh, you know, with COVID too, I had a lot of people that reached out to me that were, you know, basically climbing the walls, had a lot of anxiety. Yeah. And they said, can you say something? Can you do? And I'm like, I, I'm just a cartoon character on a show, you know, who's kind of a crabby, you know, guy does not the best advice person in the world, you know, Rock Lee, he's inspiration, Naruto's inspiration, Shikamaru Nara's like, oh, leave me alone, you know, um, but it was so nice to have people say, hey, you know, do you have anything to say, and then I would say something, or I'd say it as Shikamaru, and people to go, you know, I was really having a hard time, and then you said that, and I, I just felt better, and thank you so much, and I really love that show, and it's got me through a lot of hard times, and and, um, you know, it's, it was, a, it's an escape for a lot of kids to have 
a show that they can go, you know, after school and school is rough and weird and masks and not, and even without on a good day, school is rough. Right. And then you add on all the COVID stuff and it's worse. And then online schooling and all that stuff. And then to just be able to on their break or whenever go turn on Netflix and watch a couple episodes of Naruto and let just really escape and, and enjoy that. And I never realized how important that was until just recently. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew people liked the show and I knew they liked my character, but just recently I, I found like how people were moved um, by a lot of that stuff. And I, I guess it just hit me in a way that I never really understood. And, and even like with Asuma and um, I mean, it's cathartic. And I think people, um, I think people need to laugh, need to cry, need to need to feel. And this is a great, that show has been a great outlet for it. And, you know, it's not just a little ninja show. Right. You know? <laughs> it's a little bit more than that. And I, it, it's really wonderful to see that people are responding to it the way that they have, and they've stuck with it for so long. And we have people that, uh, you know, started watching the show when they were 10 and are now 25. You know, I did a birthday thing on Cameo for somebody who's 40, you know, (laughs) but they were 25 when the show first aired or whatever. Right. So it's like, it's so weird. Like, um, and we got kids that are 10 that are, you know, reaching out or their parents are having me do a cameo or a birthday wish or something like that for them. And, um, so that, so yeah, so that's, that's, what's great about it. I just think, um, and, you know, you don't think you have an impact and then you do, you know. So just the fact that anybody knows my name, I think is kind of interesting uh, on an ego <laughs> wise. But, you know, I'm just somebody who always wanted to perform and do things and create. And uh, you just hope that somebody hears your voice in the darkness, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it's nice to know that people are hearing it. So... So that's that's what I'll that's what I'll say about that. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know if any of that made any sense. No, it's but, fine. <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's been a joy to work on that show, and like I said, right now I'm having this weird sort of renaissance with it, and it's it's good. You feel good. You feel like you're interacting with people, and they're enjoying it and um, getting something out of it too. So um, that's great. So I I just love all the fans and. Um, just really been enjoying this sort of um, moment in the sun, and we'll see how mm-hmm. long it'll last. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for uh, willing to do this. Oh, thanks, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. And if you uh, have any interest in following the things that I'm up to, I'm at the Real Tom. Give us a TikTok and on Instagram, and uh, check me out there. And we'll see if we can make that thing grow too, and do some crazy stuff. So. Okay. At the real Tom Gibbs. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye. Bye, Chris.